Well, welcome everyone to the Beards and the Bible podcast. My name is Josh, joined by Gabe. Gabe, how are you on this beautiful, beautiful day? Doing well. Uh, nice and early. You know, we're recording this at 5.17 in the morning, and uh, the family's <clears throat> asleep. But I think my, my brain functions at a uh, higher capacity than, than at night. So... Yeah. yeah. Not that that's a very high capacity, but <laughs> Well, mine too. I'm I'm more of a morning person than I am an evening person, and we were supposed to record last night, but mm-hmm. a set of circumstances prevented it, and I I really think that when we try to record later in the evening, both you and I we're mm-hmm. just I don't know. We function better in the morning. We both do. Yeah. Yeah, I was a little bit late. I was like 5 minutes late jumping in this morning because I had to feed the cats. Um, otherwise, we would have had a cacophony <laughs> of um, rescue cats scratching at my <laughs> studio door and meowing. And so they're all happy and hey. placated. That's good. Hey, let's. What's the roster count on the cats right now? How many you got? Mm. <laughs> still, because last still, a couple of episodes, it was like I don't know a dozen. How many we got now? Yeah, yeah. I think we're. I think we're down a couple more. I don't know. Mm-hmm. Uh, like, like here it is here's what it is um we we have a couple of the females that are spoken for the female kittens mm-hmm. but they need to get stacy wants to spay them first so they're not going to leave till like later mm. at the end of this month and um yeah and then our then our cat population will diminish a little bit more she's um okay. she's printing out flyers and putting them all around the neighborhood <laughs> and other neighborhoods and because here's the thing i guess facebook uh facebook doesn't allow you to post like free animals you know like really if rescued this yeah yeah facebook's trying to huh trying to keep crack down on tr- that facebook's huh? tr- facebook's trying to create crazy cat women basically i guess so it's a conspiracy yeah, it's, that's yeah i think so yeah. yeah man so you never answered the question how many are you are you ashamed to oh. just tell me a number is that no i don't do you know, know a number there's just there's well, just so many you don't. two i honestly i honestly couldn't <laughs> tell you right now but <laughs> <laughs> They're not. So I went up there and I fed them, because I was like, I need to, I need to, I need to lure them away from. And bless, bless their hearts. The two that we started, like this, our cats. There were two of them. They were like mostly mm-hmm. indoor cats. Every day they're just like, put us outside, please. This is we cannot live in this, <laughs> this environment. Is madness. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. yeah oh, so and I'm funny, like the same man. way. I'm like, put me outside, please. Um. So <laughs> I, I fed them up there and I just like. I sprinkled like dry food on this plate for them and they all just like stared at me like what is this garbage you just put on this plate because Stacy's usually like giving them like this wet food you know and um <laughs> so cats are funny man cats are interesting creatures yeah I never thought that I would actually enjoy our cat you know because he found us but I don't know man there's like a soft soft place in my heart for the guy he's kind of become mm. part of the family now so it's funny how animals Animals can wear you down like that. Mm. It's crazy. Yeah. Yeah. They so get, how's they life get been? You through, they get you through the kids. The kids are super attached, and you're like, oh, I, it's nice that... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. And, and, and then us you, as dads... As you that, try to pet it. Yeah. yeah. As soon as you try well, to then pet us it, 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 it scratches the mess out of you. <laughs> yeah. Well, then us as dads, because we're awake before most of our kids, we get to know the animals mm-hmm. one-on-one, because the animals are like, oh, you're awake? Mm-hmm feed me you're like ah oh, crap so then we feed him and so the animals are like you are my person i am your manservant i shall be yours until the day i die and so mm. like my dog is sitting next to me and every morning because i'm the one that wakes up first he's always yeah sleeps by my bed wakes up in the morning with me yeah has for the past 12 years so <laughs> crazy that's funny yeah, so speaking of which, yeah. like, how's life, man? Is it good? Work's good. 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 Family's yeah. good. Life Always is good. good. Church is yeah. good. <laughs> that was a lot oh, of, everything's lot good. Of, uh, yeah. Everything's good. Yeah. Yeah. Busy. Busy, but good. Yeah. How about you? Uh, man, we just got back from a vacation last Thursday, and uh, we did nothing for like a week, which was amazing. We went to my dad's in Good. coastal South Carolina and spent a lot of time 
hanging out by the pool and sleeping in and playing golf and going to the beach and eating a lot of food and being lazy and it was everything I ever mm. hoped it would be. But then I yes. came home and jumped right into the weekend and preached four services and had a full day Monday with uh, Next Steps class Monday night. I was there late Monday night and then yesterday I was crazy busy trying to dig out all the emails and text and phone calls that accumulated while I'm gone. And so mm-hmm. taking a week off is good, but when you come back, you always end up working twice as hard when you come back. So I think when you're on vacation, though, all those emails, all those emails and voicemails that you get and whatever, you know, that's the net block of time. I think you can just delete all of those without reading them. There's <laughs> them. And I think people, I think, I think people know that you just wrote all that off. Basically. I think you're allowed yeah. to do that. So yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll take that to consideration that. for next time. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I, I don't know if that would lead my church to a place of a revival. Hmm. Was that a good segue? It was. Yeah, like uh like on Azusa Street or were we gonna talk about the Jesus mm. people? I was gonna talk about how I am a Jesus person and I've never there's nothing that you could do with Azusa Street, because Azusa doesn't sound like any other word. Lollapazooza? Mm. Sounds like you're sneezing. Azusa! Or sounds like a like a kind of soup you would eat at the Olive Garden. Have you tried the Azusa soup? <laughs> yeah, what is the etymology of Azusa? I guess it's just the name I, of a, I, that, the name of the street. Yeah, I think so. In Los Angeles, so um, Gabe and I both went to a Pentecostal, as a Assemblies of God, um, Institution of Higher Learning, Southeastern University. You've heard us talk about it many times on the podcast. And in the communication building, there was the Pentecostal Library with a whole monument and museum set up for the Azusa Street Revival. Do you remember this? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And I always found that very curious because I didn't grow up Pentecostal, didn't grow up in the Assemblies of God. And first time I really heard about the Azusa Street Revival was coming to Southeastern. And man, it was like, when I talk about like mm-hmm. respected, it was like, memorialized like it was some almost like biblical occurrence right yeah and i remember yeah, I would say the 100 it's kind of like kind of like the events of acts 2 and then just below that azusa street it's kind of how how that's viewed in the yeah. Pente- pentecostalism yeah well i remember the 100th anniversary of azusa street i was at southeastern still in 2006 um man people made such a big deal about it and I was very curious about that. I never really knew the details of it. I just knew kind of what was on the placards at the you know little museum they had up and what we would learn in our classes about the history of the Assemblies of God. Um, but, I mean, did you hear about Azusa Street growing up, Assemblies of God, or was that not until you got to college? Hmm. I would say not, not as much growing up, but, but definitely when I got to college, yeah. Hmm. Yeah, so if you've never heard of the Azusa Street Revival, don't worry, we'll, we'll unpack it and break it down. If you grew up Assemblies of God, Church of God, um, United Pentecostal, any of these mainline Pentecostal denominations, chances are you have heard about Azusa Street and you probably were um, you know, really, really inundated with that. But uh, we're going to talk about that today, and it's a very interesting and very important movement even from a sociological standpoint, because the largest group of Christians today is Pentecostal and Charismatic. There's 500 million Pentecostal and Charismatics across the entire globe. Mm. It's crazy. Um, Especially in the global south. So global south would not be like, um, you know, the southern United States, but like below the equator, like South America, Mm. Africa, Southeast Asia, in those places... Um, charismatic and Pentecostalism is the fastest growing movement. So, and we we probably have Azusa Street to uh, to thank for that. So, and how about the Jesus People movement? Familiar with that? Yeah, yeah, very familiar with that. 
Okay. We'll talk about that today, too. We've done an episode kind of talking about that, where we talked about the juvenilization of mm-hmm. Christianity. Remember that episode? It was a couple yeah, of years yeah. ago. But And so... This is, uh, if you're just now jumping in, this is part three of what will be four parts of the history of revival movements uh, re- we're calling Revival in the Land. So just in case you're jumping in, and we're kind of moving forward yes. chronologically in time, and today we're going to talk about the Azusa Street Revival, which happened around the turn of the century in 1906, 1915, and then we're going to get jump ahead in time to uh, the Jesus Movement, as it's come to be known. Yes, Absolutely. So last episode, we talked about the first Great Awakening that would happen in the American colonies. And the second Great Awakening, which would have happened 1790 to about 1840. So about a 50 year span of a revival of religious fervor and kind of spiritual renewal that swept across America. So then if you know your history, you've got the American Civil War. And that happens 1861 to 1865. Obviously, that is a huge game changer in the history of the United States of America. And one of the biggest issues after the Civil War is Reconstruction. And how do you deal with the issue of former slaves that now are free? Hmm. And... Lest we think that this is, you know, just something that you are thinking about when it comes to owning land and voting and stuff like that. One of the biggest places where kind of segregation and all this stuff started really affecting was church. Um, even today, it's been said that the most segregated hour of the week is Sunday morning between black church and white church. So... As we head into the turn of the century in the early 1900s, segregation, race relations, all that stuff, man, that is like everywhere, all across the United States. Um, In the American South, that's particularly tense with Jim Crow laws and, you know, organizations like the Ku Klux Klan and you've got lynchings and things like that. So there's not as much of a um, feeling of freedom in the American South um, amongst former freed slaves and their children. So if you, you're African-American, man, that's a, you're not really free. I mean, you are technically, you're not a slave, but I mean, you're still a sharecropper. You're still kind of living under that oppression. And then kind of as you move out of the South into places, even like Kansas, Kansas was a very um, rural area in a lot of places. And so in a place like Kansas, Um, all of those things are still very much at work, uh, particularly in the church. So in Topeka, Kansas, in 1905, there's a guy by the name of William Seymour. He is a one-eyed son of freed slaves, and there's a picture of him on the show notes. And there he is with his one eye. Gabe, I'm sure you can see a picture of William Seymour. Mm -hmm. Uh, He was a pastor of a very small holiness church and the holiness denominations were kind of the fruit of the second great awakening so if you remember the second great awakening we talked about in the methodist and wesleyan movement was a very very um it moved really quickly with circuit riders and things like that and um kind of heavy arminian in their theology uh very much into um when I say holiness, we'll talk about like what sanctification means. Complete sanctification would be kind of one of their distinctives. And we'll talk about that as we get into this. And so he was a, um, he was a pastor of a very small holiness church. And interestingly enough, he was kind of discipled by a white preacher named Charles Parham. And Charles Parham was considered kind of the first um, Pentecostal preacher to teach a certain doctrine called the third work of grace. And that is that we need to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit that's evidenced by the speaking of tongues. 
And so that's a guy named Charles Parham that discipled this uh, 34-year-old William Seymour in that. And what's interesting is William Seymour had never experienced it. He'd never spoken in tongues, but he was preaching it. <laughs> hmm. And so he's, he's preaching this in his church. He's kind of repeating what he'd been discipled in by Charles Parham. Charles Parham is a kind of a, his, his own man because like there's not mainline Pentecostal denominations. So Charles Parham is kind of preaching this kind of new message. And as William Seymour is preaching this, there's a woman by the name of Neely Terry who is from Los Angeles, and she visits Seymour's church. She hears about it. She hears about him preaching this message of you've got to be baptized in the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in tongues, which is funny because William Seymour has never experienced this personally. And she says, hey, you got to come back to California, and you got to preach this in my church. So William Seymour says, okay. And his mentor, Charles Parham, says, I'll even help you out with it. I'll give you some money so you can travel to Los Angeles, California from Topeka, Kansas, and you can preach in your church. So he Hmm. comes to Los Angeles, February 1906. He starts preaching at this small little holiness church. Um, Los Angeles is a really interesting place in the early 1900s. You've got a ton of immigrants. Um, it's, It's starting to become a big city, but it's not anything close to what we think. We think of Los Angeles. Um, not only do you have a rising population of African Americans, but you've got immigrants from Mexico, obviously. You've got immigrants from um, China and Asian countries. And so um, it's a very diverse place. It's a very poor place. And where he's preaching is right in the middle of kind of the center of what we would say is kind of the, the immigrant neighborhood, right? I mean, it's not like the nice part of town and so he starts preaching this sermon that you've got to receive the baptism of the holy spirit with the evidence of speaking in tongues and the elders of this church are like well that's interesting have you ever experienced this and he's like well no but (laughs) you gotta experience it so they're like well i don't think that you need to preach here so they kick him out of this (laughs) church and he's still in Los Angeles for a month, but some people in Los Angeles say, hey, you can come preach at our house. And so other holiness churches hear about this visiting preacher from Topeka, Kansas, and they start coming together. And what's interesting is a lot of them are white. So you've got white families crowding in this church with black families, so this is already a cause of some controversy, as we'll see as we kind of get into this. And so they start fasting and praying and worshiping. And after five weeks of Seymour preaching and people praying and, and they are fasting, they did like a 10-day fast. And at this point, man, nobody's speaking in tongues, but everybody's saying that in order to have the Baptist of the Holy Spirit, you have to speak in tongues. So after three days into this 10-day fast, there's a man at the meeting named Edward Lee who speaks in tongues for the very first time. And so at the next meeting, Seymour begins to talk about that and say, man, this guy, Edward Lee, he got, he got the baptism of tongues. Like, let's, let's press in. Let's get more of that. So he preaches a sermon on Acts 2, 4, six other people speak in tongues. Uh, and then a few days later, April 12th, the leader of the meeting who had never spoken in tongues but was preaching about that you have to speak in tongues, he speaks in tongues for the first time. And that happens after Mm -hmm. praying all night long. (laughs) So here's what gets interesting. Um, This little house, I mean, there's people packed into this house. They're praying all night. They're, you know, people are sharing testimonies. They're preaching. They're worshiping. And it starts to circulate across the community. So, people from the African-American, Latino, and white residents of the city would come to this house and for hours, like all night long, people are praying and singing and sharing testimonies and they crowd in this house so much that the front porch of the house literally collapses. Like the house starts to fall apart because there's too many people. Um, So like one resident of the neighborhood said that people were shouting until the foundation of the house gave way. So like they were worshiping so hard, the house literally collapsed. (laughs) Goodness. Wouldn't you like to be a service like that? 
Well, how was the church service, man? We brought the house down. Really? No, like literally, we brought the house down. Like it collapsed. What's interesting uh, when you look at Google Maps and you zoom in, uh, you know, there's nothing there. It's uh, when you look at Azusa Street. It's like mm -hmm. right, just 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 south of Little Tokyo in downtown Los Angeles. I mean, like right in the middle of downtown Los Angeles. Yeah. But there's nothing there now. I mean, they must have leveled all, all that that block and built up mm -hmm. new houses and stuff. But yeah, it's just a little alleyway called Azusa Street, and uh, there's like yeah. a a boba tea. There's you know they're like little crepe yeah, store yeah, yeah. there's different things like that but it's it's interesting how there's no as far as i know there's no museum or no monument or anything it's all been really built up i i think there's a placard there maybe um because yeah, i've seen it on like people's social media they'll go to to try to you know see the site there and there's like just one little placard you know but it's i mean you're right it's not in the middle of a you know nice neighborhood or anything like that i mean it's it's right in the middle of mm -hmm. um you know, an immigrant neighborhood. So, yeah, I mean, it's, it's pretty interesting. I think what's so interesting about that whole, how it all got started is like this guy saying, Hey, we have to have this experience with God. I've never had it, but we need to have it. And mm -hmm. so it very much, I think in their mind, they're thinking about the disciples in the upper room praying to receive the promise of the father that Jesus said is going to be poured out in the city of Jerusalem. Right. I mean, they're, they're literally trying to, you know, press in and receive from God, this thing called the Holy spirit, which again, we'll kind of unpack theologically where we land on that. But so, um, after all that happens, they move to a new building. It was originally an African Methodist Episcopal church at 312 Azusa Street. So this is after the house collapses on North Bonnie Bray Street. <laughs> and um, by mid-May 1906, every day, anywhere from 300 to 1,500 people would try to fit into the building. And the building had most recently been a stable. And so apparently flies were a constant presence. It wasn't a nice building. For many means, I mean, it was just basically a, a crude meeting house where they just threw some benches together. I think one account I was reading said they didn't really have much of a stage or a platform, so whoever was sharing would stand on like a milk crate. And people from a diversity of backgrounds would come together. There'd be men, women, children, black, white, Asian, Native American immigrants, rich, poor, illiterate, and then educated. William Seymour's own literacy isn't in question. Um, he at one point in his life uh, as an adult could not read and um, I want to say uh, I may get this wrong but he was not allowed to attend seminary in Topeka because he was black and so he would stand outside of the seminary with the windows open listening into classes so he could get some sort of um, education so he could learn to read and preach the Bible so kind of interesting how, mm. how that happened. So, I mean, this was a pretty controversial thing, right? Because this is 1906. This is the height of racial segregation. This is 14 years before women received the right to, the right to vote. <clears throat> so the fact that, like, you came into this meeting house in Azusa Street, it didn't matter if you were white, black, man, woman, immigrant, like, you were all there for the same reason. And it was completely equal footing right the leader of this was an african-american preacher that had been left out of seminary uh education and apparently the worship services were not like you know okay service starts at six o'clock and we're gonna have a liturgy that we follow they were almost around the clock hmm. and people would come in mainly from the holiness movement but also you'd see baptists mennonites quakers and even Presbyterians. Hmm. Yeah. That's how so you know it was a real. That's how you know it was a real move of the spirit. Um, man, we could go on and on about just kind of what it was like. I'm fascinated by descriptions of it. Um, 
apparently one observer said there was no instruments. You didn't need any because people were just singing. People, somebody would just start a song and everybody would sing together. They wouldn't take up a collection. They wouldn't have to advertise the meetings because the word just kind of spread. There was no church organization to back it. Um, this is what somebody wrote. All who were in touch with God realized as soon as they entered the meeting that the Holy Ghost is the leader. Hmm. So, um, yeah, it must have been a very unique um, experience walking in that room. I like to like to have just stuck my head in. Just I would say I'd like to be a fly on the wall, <laughs> but it kind of sounds like the flies were not on the wall. They were trying, trying to bite people. Yeah. but On your face. Yeah. <laughs> So, um, the LA Times heard about this, and so reporters from the LA Times started coming in, and they were not very kind in describing what they saw. I'll read a quote from the LA Times. Meetings are held in a tumble-down shack on Azusa Street. Devotees of the weird doctrine practice the most fanatical rites preach the wildest theories and work themselves into a state of mad excitement and their peculiar zeal. Colored people and a sprinkling of whites compose the congregation, and the night is made hideous in the neighborhood by the howlings of the worshipers who spend hours swaying forth and back in a nerve-wracking attitude of prayer and supplication. They claim to have, quote, the gift of tongues and be able to understand the babble. So the LA Times was like, these people are out of their mind. <laughs> um, there was a publication that came from the Holiness Church Movement, and here was the here was their description of what often happened when visitors would come in. Proud, well-dressed preachers would come to investigate. Soon their high looks were replaced with wonder. Then conviction came. And very often you would find them in a short time wallowing on the dirty floor, asking God to forgive them and make them like little children. Wow. Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah, it is. So everything that we have talked about that accompanied former revivals, like the first great awakening, second great awakening were present in Azusa street. The distinction about Azusa street, I think there was such an emphasis on the gift of tongues. And so that's really what you saw more than anything in Azusa Street. Um, but it wasn't just that. There were people that were being prayed for to be healed. Um, there was prayers for the sick, for missionaries. There were altar calls, spontaneous preaching. And it would go on and on and on in that. But, I mean, it, it was just a, a very unique type of movement, especially the fact that it was spontaneous and it was around the clock. So, I mean, that's, that in and of itself is a miracle. Like, how do you sustain that, right? <laughs> do they get tired <laughs> yeah. or want to eat or, or, you know? So, um, remember our buddy Charles Parham, the guy that um, discipled William Seymour? Yeah. And he hears about this. Yeah. And he's like, man, wow, God's really moving into the Zusa Street. So, he comes in October of 1906. Zusa Street really broke out in May of 1906. So, he comes to LA and he's like, man, what's happening to Zusa Street? And so he walks in the room and he recoils in disgust because of the racial intermingling. Hmm. He was uh -oh. apparently shocked and disturbed and angered because what he said, this is his quote, white people are imitating unintelligent crude negroisms of the Southland and laying it on the Holy Ghost. Jeez. So he make, yeah. <laughs> so he makes his way through the crowd, stands up at the pulpit, and says, "God is sick at his stomach," and he proceeded to explain that God would not stand for such animalism. So he goes to a separate building at the nearby Women's Christian Temperance Union building and starts having a different set of meetings, and. Uh, so, yeah, our buddy Charles Parham was not a big fan, apparently. Yeah, I mean, he uh, he did not mince his words when he came to his <laughs> criticism of this meeting. Yeah. It's intense. I, I, I mean, I guess, like, 
it's 1906, so there's these sentiments, but like I just don't understand that. Like, how do you get there, spiritually speaking, to get to a point where you think that God is somehow disgusted by white and black people worshiping together? Yeah, or can you imagine walking into a, a worship service and then standing up and being like, this makes God sick to his stomach. <laughs> you, you're behaving like animals, essentially. Like, that's that would be really awkward. Really yeah, awkward. it would. It would. Some guy's like rolling around the ground. He's like, who? Me? Like, looks up. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. I don't, I mean, like, obviously, like, that kind of racism is not of God. And yeah. so his racism was not right. But I wonder if he saw something else there, not just like, I wonder if what bothered him besides the racial intermingling was, you know, people that he maybe saw were acting in a way that was showy or like we talked about in the first great awakening and Jonathan Edwards talked about, you know, the false religious fervor or whatever. I wonder if that's something that, Parham saw as well. I don't know, because um, oh, yeah. what what makes the history books is his racism. So, Charles mm-hmm. Parham, if you've not been such a racist, maybe we could have heard what else you had to say about it. But <laughs> so, by 1913, so it started in 1906. By 1913, it kind of lost momentum. Most of the media and attention and crowds kind of left by 1915. Um, Seymour stayed there for the rest of his life. He unfortunately died of a heart attack on, uh, in 1922 and his wife, Jenny led the church until 1931 and the congregation lost the building. And that's why there's not a building there. So if you go to Azusa street, like Gabe was saying, you're in the middle of just a normal neighborhood in Los Angeles. It's not anything to write home about. Um, so that was his industry. I mean, it was, you know, pretty wild how it got started. Um, doesn't seem to be exceptionally organized. Seems to be very different than the Second Great Awakening because Second Great Awakening, if you were listening last episode, was very much structured and we're going to have revival services and meetings and it's not a really a move of God. It's us being obedient to God and God shows up. This was very much just like the Holy Ghost is the one running this. We're just kind of here. Mm-hmm. Um... But let's talk about their theology, because this is where it gets interesting, and this is where I think a lot of people, as we start to kind of lift the hood on Azusa Street, may kind of raise an eyebrow and go, hmm. So the theology of uh, William Seymour and his mentor, Charles Parham, was that there was really three works of grace that are necessary in the life of of a believer. The first is the new birth. That's the first work of grace. The second is something called entire sanctification. That is the second work of grace. And this was kind of something borrowed from John Wesley. John Wesley believed in this, but a lot of Methodists did not believe in it. And entire sanctification is the idea that the heart has to be cleansed completely before the Holy Ghost can come. And the quote is, the Holy Spirit cannot occupy an unclean vessel. And depending on who you talk to about entire sanctification, it is either sinless perfectionism, which means you can grow in your faith to a point where you just stop sinning. Hmm. Which that's always odd to me, because it's like, who who gets to say that you've stopped sinning? Do you get to say that, or does that dude around you? Like, does your wife get to say that? <laughs> Yeah. I've stopped sinning today. Well, it kind of seems like you're guilty of pride. So there you go. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so some people say it's sinless perfection. But other people just say it's a type of spiritual maturity marked by just kind of a pure love to God and personal holiness and just kind of a sold out state where you're just sold out to the Lord. Right. But interestingly, um, most mainline Pentecostal denominations today, that's the symbols of God, church of God, uh, would reject this teaching. And this is uh, something you see after Azusa Street. There's kind of lines in the sand, like, no, we don't believe that. And they call themselves finished work Pentecostals. So I never heard this in the Assemblies of God. I mean, you, you would not hear this in most mainline Pentecostal denominations. You would hear it in Pentecostal holiness denominations, though. Hmm. Um, 
Have you heard any of this? Have you ever encountered somebody that's a entire sanctification guy? No. I mean, even the verbiage itself, like that kind of language, it just doesn't really show up much in Pentecostal congregations. You don't, you don't, Pentecostalism, and I'm not, I, I grew up in that, so I can criticize a little bit. They don't, they aren't known for conducting classes in theology in their in their churches and, and congregations. Right. The pastor isn't going to, you know, conduct a uh, <laughs> systematic theology class for Sunday school or something like that. That's more, mm -hmm. you know, and and don't get me wrong. Like, there's a lot of there there are some good things in Pentecostalism, but um, I would say I would say that some denominations that do a good job of teaching systematic theology would be. You know, Southern Baptists, for instance, they do a really good job mm -hmm. of making sure all their adherents and their congregants uh, understand their theology um, and educating yep. them. But no, I, I just never, never really heard this terminology until I really got to college and was attending a a university that was influenced by Pentecostalism. That I started to hear this kind of verbiage. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's kind of funny. It, you you don't hear it systematically taught, but you see it show up. Right. It's kind of that. Mm -hmm assumption that everyone has that's there you know mm -hmm. that we all kind of believe this but we're, nobody's ever really said it out loud hey this is specifically what we believe in terms of you know entire sanctification if they do believe that which again most church of god assembly of god don't believe in entire sanctification but yeah. what sets I... go ahead go ahead oh i was gonna say i i, I just I grew up around a lot of Pentecostal holiness people and adherents and went to high school with a lot of mm. Pentecostal holiness adherents. And, um, you know, to ask them questions like, you know, just being oblivious high schoolers say like, why don't you cut your hair? Or why don't you wear makeup? Or why are you wearing long, a long dress every day? And they mm -hmm. just really wouldn't have an answer. They would just kind of like, well, that's cause that's just what we do. Or that's what my parents don't want. But there wasn't this, it didn't seem like they were very well educated on, on, why they're doing what they're doing or why they're not doing it. But what were you going to say? There's, there seems to be something. Well, it, yeah. I mean, it, it seems like a lot of this stuff is just sort of passed down generationally and it's kind of like everybody's doing it, mm -hmm. you know? And so that's, that's part of it. Um, yeah. But I, I think the, the one thing you will hear that makes a Pentecostal church a Pentecostal church is the emphasis on what William Seymour taught as the third work of grace. Mm -hmm. And that is the baptism of the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in tongues. Now, all throughout church history, so, I mean, you can go back to the 100s, 200s, 300s, this practice of galicoli or how are you want to say it, glossolalia is how some people say it, but what, speaking in an unknown language, not an actual human language, in an unknown heavenly language. That has been around since, again, the early church. But most of the time it's just been understood as a spiritual gift that God gives to some, right? Right. But what the Pentecostal movement started teaching, again, through guys like Charles Parham, is that it's available for everybody. And it's not necessarily a, a spiritual gift. Yes, it is a spiritual gift, but it's more than that. It's the evidence that you have the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. And so, man, this is so heavily emphasized in mainline Pentecostal denominations and and this is when you hear a pentecostal worship services this is this is what people think about this particular doctrine and that got started in azusa street well and the implication with that is that if you're not speaking in tongues you're obviously i mean the, like i said the indirect implication is that you're not you're not born again because if you're born again you're baptized mm -hmm. in the holy spirit if you're baptized in the holy spirit then you're speaking in other tongues and that's right. the real that's that's the real rub there, I guess, with myself mm -hmm. and, and Pentecostalism is that that's no that's not scriptural. There is a gift right. of speaking in tongues, like you mentioned, but it's not this universal um, evidence of your salvation. Right, and that's where I would disagree with mainline Pentecostalism. I do not believe that everyone speaks in tongues. 
Mm-hmm. Um, Acts 2 is where most Pentecostals go. It was where the people in Azusa Street went, is Acts 2. It was just the day of Pentecost. And Gabe, you've preached on the day of Pentecost. You did a wonderful teaching on that, um, <clears throat> where there's so many things happening there with mm-hmm. the birth of the church connected to like the birth of the nation of Israel and all that stuff. Um, so it seems like what's happening in Acts 2, where the Holy Spirit is poured out on the church, where they're speaking in actual human languages, is something very different from the gift of tongues that you read about in 1 Corinthians 12 and 13 and 14. Am I off on that, or do you think I'm kind of in the in, in biblical no, uh, I, I, orthodoxy with that? I believe it's entirely different, and I've had people tell me, well, they were probably speaking in gibberish, and there was a miracle happening in the ears of the hearers in Acts chapter 2, um, and then some people say, well, is the miracle in the tongue of the speakers and they're speaking in those languages? I've heard different theories, but basically people trying to take this ecstatic, uh, I hate to use the word gibberish, but it's kind of ecstatic, unknown language, prayer language, and trying to fit it into the narrative of Acts chapter 2. And I think it just doesn't fit. It's hard to make that yeah. work. You have to really eisegete that into that, that portion of, of, the, of the narrative. So, yeah, I'm in agreement with you on that. Yeah. So um, I have great respect for Pentecostal churches. Obviously, I owe them a a, a debt of gratitude for, you know, what they taught me and all that stuff. But I would just disagree on that. I think the gift of tongues is available, but it's given to who the Holy Spirit chooses to give it to. I don't think everybody has to speak in tongues, and I don't think it's the evidence that you have the Holy Spirit. Because you can fake the gift of tongues, but Jesus said you'll know them by their fruit. And the fruit of the Spirit is character. It looks like Christ. So you can't really fake Christ-like character over the duration of your lifetime. But you can fake spiritual gifts. Um, so that's, that's kind of where I would land with that. So I would say there's a controversy with Azusa Street theologically. And I think that we can look back on that now and go, yeah, I don't, I don't, think, that's, I don't think that's biblical, kind of where they landed on that, that you have to speak in tongues, you don't have the Holy Spirit. Other controversies, the biggest controversy at the time is what we look back now and we kind of just roll our eyes at, was racial integration. Mm. Um, Where mainline pastors would come in just going, no, this isn't of God because whites and blacks are mixing. (laughs) So Mm. I really do think that God was at work in certain aspects of Azusa Street. So even though I disagree theologically with kind of that main premise, um, it's just like God to kind of come in and shatter these man-made unbiblical theologies of racial segregation. Um, so yeah, I, I, I just think that's interesting that that was the biggest controversy at the time. Mm-hmm. Um, secular media at the time was very, very critical of it. We've already talked about that, but the aftermath before we move on to the Jesus people movement, the aftermath of the Azusa Street Revival, again, it's commonly regarded as the beginning of the modern day Pentecostal movement. From Azusa Street, there was the sending of so many missionaries that over 50 nations were touched by Azusa Street and miniature Pentecostal revivals broke out in 50 nations. Um, some 38 missionaries left in just October of 1906 to go back to their home countries with this religious zeal, with this religious fervor, wow. which is crazy. I mean, that's, it's amazing. Mm-hmm. Um, so you had the birth of the Pentecostal movement. You had the sending of missionaries. You had the form of new denominations. So... There was a lot of these Wesleyan holiness denominations that started to become what we know of as Pentecostal holiness denominations. So the Church of God in Christ, which is predominantly an African-American denomination, the Pentecostal Holiness Church, um, the Apostolic Faith Church. So those would be ones that all say the three works of grace, right? Conversion, complete sanctification, Baptism of the Holy Spirit with the gift of tongues. But then other ones were like, no, we don't believe in complete sanctification. So they became known as finished work Pentecostal churches. 
and that was the Assemblies of God and the Church of God. Um, mm-hmm. But then somewhere along the way, there was a doctrinal controversy between Trinitarian and Oneness Pentecostals. And so that became the United Pentecostal Church in 1945. So um, UPCI is kind of what they're known as now, the United Pentecostal Church International. So all of that stems back to Azusa Street. So hmm. pretty interesting. Yeah, it is It is remarkable that, I mean, you go to rural, very rural parts of Africa and there are... Pentecostal churches, you know, meeting in little tiny shacks and sheds, and um, it's it's a prolific movement for sure. Yeah, yeah, and it's amazing to me how that's probably one of the biggest in Uganda, the nation that you and I mm-hmm. go to. And even mm-hmm. if a church isn't officially Pentecostal, they're influenced heavily by Pentecostal teachings. Yeah, and that started in that little building in Los Angeles. So fascinating. So that kind of simmered down in 1915-ish. And so if you know your history, what happens around that time is you have the Great War, as we know it as World War I. You have the Roaring Twenties with the Prohibition and Organized Crime. And then you've got the Great Depression in the 1930s. Then you have World War II in the 1940s. So America goes through a series of massive changes as a culture. And then World War II ends. The GIs come back from World War II. And America's been through a lot. I mean, you've got so many things they've gone through. The Great Depression, World War I, the Spanish Flu, World War II, the Prohibition, all this stuff. And so what you see in the 1950s is... Um, People move into the American suburbs, financial affluence, the rise of the middle class, um, the birth of something called the teenager. You never really had a teenager up until that time. Um, This is kind of like the whole leave it to beaver, my two sons, you know. (laughs) You got your car in your driveway and your dad that goes and works at the office and mom that stays home with the two kids and everybody's kind of putting on this front that, you know, God and country and family and church. That's that's what the United States is about, right? So um, that's the 1950s. And then comes the 1960s. <laughs> and you see the Vietnam War, the Civil Rights Movement, the Sexual Revelation, Revelation, Sexual Revolution. It was a revelation that sexual ethics were no longer needed. The Hippie Movement. Right? Summer of love. Hmm. And so, man, the 60s were were nuts. Like, we were moving as a country in the direction that, I mean, it was was crazy just how fast we were moving towards secularism and hedonism. And um, out on the West Coast, man, you had people moving from all over the country that are teenagers and young people running away from home looking to join kind of um, what was known as sort of the hippie movement, right? Looking for answers in religion and spirituality and psychedelic drugs. And and this is where you see like cult groups like the Manson family and stuff like that. And so a lot of them coming to California are burnout. They're searching. There's this massive mission field amongst amongst the youth, especially in the West Coast. And so one would look at that and go, man, like what good could ever come out of that, right? (laughs) And so there's a pastor by the name of Chuck Smith in Costa Mesa, California. Have you ever seen a picture of Chuck Smith? Yeah, yeah. Interesting guy. Does he look cool to you? Very. (laughs) Like does he look stylish or... Yeah, just Google him. He doesn't look very. Um, yeah, he looks very. Um, des- describe his physical appearance. Uh, just a, uh, just looks like a really nice grandpa. Like I don't know, just <laughs> yes, rocking, rocking the turtlenecks and just you know, just has a nice yeah. smile. And 
Yeah, but yeah. does not look like someone that you would say is like, like he's not going out and getting tattoos and making himself super relevant to the crowd he's preaching to. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So this like normal white bread pastor in Costa Mesa, California is preaching on a Sunday night in 1965. He's He's been preaching for about 17 years. And he just kind of looks at that way they're doing church. And he's just like, guys, we're not, we're not doing it. Like young people don't want to come to church. All these washed out hippies that are like sleeping on the beach at night and smoking dope during the day, they want nothing to do with this. This is so stuffy and so staunch and the Holy Spirit is not even welcome here. Like we got to change this. Um, we're going to do a new service format to try to reach these young people. And it's so disturbed the board of his church. They called a meeting and Chuck Smith said, well, you know what? I'm, I'm called by God to be a shepherd of the church. I'm not your hireling. And so he leaves that church and starts a new ministry called Calvary Chapel, in Costa Mesa, California. Mm-hmm. And really the aim of Calvary Chapel was he was really compelled by the Lord to, to try to reach this group of people that were in his own backyard that no church was reaching. And in 1968, he comes across an 18 year old, which I just thought's crazy, 18 years old Pentecostal evangelist named Lonnie Frisbee. Hmm. It kind of sounds like a name you would have made up to do prank calls in college. <laughs> What was your prank call name? What was that guy's name? Phil. What was his name? A couple of, uh, Phil O'Connors and uh, yeah. Mike Zorn. Yeah. Yeah. Now Lonnie Lonnie Tell Frisbee it. Frisbee <laughs> Frisbee looks like the kind of guy who is gonna is gonna be up in this hippie movement preaching the gospel. <laughs> like he looks, he fits yes. the bill. He's got long hair. Yeah. I mean, he looks like your your typical nineteen eighties like dramatic reenactment of what Jesus looked like. Um, <laughs> yes, he parted does. in the middle, long hair. Remember that, that old, <laughs> that old movie, Jesus of Nazareth that came out in the, the yep. early, was it an eighties or? It was probably seventies. I mean, yeah. Like, yeah. Yeah. Around there. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. He's got the feathered hair, the beard, the like tunic shirt. Yeah. Hmm. So Lonnie Frisbee was a hippie. He was a really I mean, he was in that movement for a while. So Chuck Smith got Lonnie Frisbee paired up with a guy named John Higgins, and they started a Christian commune called the House of Miracles. And so these two guys, John and Lonnie, went out into the community to reach the youth of the gospel. But let's just talk a little bit about Lonnie Frisbee. I put a picture of him in the show notes when Gabe's kind of describing. Yeah, he's everything you would think of when you think of a hippie from the 60s. I mean, looks like a guy that you just look at him and you're like, that guy smells like patchouli. I bet he doesn't wear deodorant either. I mean, just, <laughs> he, he was a really interesting dude. He had a very traumatic, abusive childhood. He was actually, I think I, think I read um, as I was studying for this, he was raped when he was eight years old, um, sexually abused, neglected. So he left home and he's like, 13 or 14, he started getting into the gay underground scene in Laguna Beach, California. Mm. He started taking a lot of psychedelics, started getting involved in a lot of occult practices. And so he would take LSD, he'd drop acid, and he would um, read the Bible while he was tripping on acid. Um, yeah, so again, like if you've ever been in like really hippy dippy groups of people there's a lot of drug use but there's also this like open-mindedness of just about really anything right just like there's some sort of higher power there's some sort of a spiritual element somewhere and then we've done an episode about psychedelics and connecting with the divine so like mm-hmm. Lonnie Frisbee and his friends that were were really open to that like as they're in mysticism and the occult. And so Mm -hmm. they would take acid and Lonnie would read to them the gospel of John. And he's not even a Christian, but he's like taking these guys and baptizing them. And um, he, he starts having these visions while he's tripping acid of him preaching 
to a vast sea of people crying out to the Lord for salvation. And uh, he's into UFOs, hypnotism, the occultism, mysticism. And finally, some Christian missionaries come to him and preach to him the gospel. And they say when they find him, he's all about Jesus and flying saucers, which I just, <laughs> I just think is hilarious. Oh, wow. um, yeah. So he's converted. He's an artist living in San Francisco. And uh, there's a lot about that. He was in a Christian community in San Francisco. But anyway, he comes to Costa Mesa with Chuck Smith. They start this House of Miracles ministry, which is, again, a Christian commune. And within one week, they had 35 new converts. And they start building bunk beds in Chuck Smith's garage to house all of the new converts. And Lonnie Frisbee, he's only 18, he leads this Wednesday night Bible study, and pretty soon there's thousands of teenagers and young people from the hippie movement coming to this Bible study. Um, he's more of a kind of charismatic Pentecostal evangelist style. He's very much just conversational, um, kind of just sort of flows with the Holy Spirit. But Chuck Smith takes on the job of really discipling the people that get converted by Lonnie Frisbee. And he's like chapter by chapter, verse by verse, line by line, exegetical Bible teaching. I mean, you can go back and read Chuck Smith's entire Bible commentary on every book of the Bible. Um, so if you are interested in Calvary Chapel churches now, I mean, they go through, all right, we're going to go through the book of Philippians. And it's literally every verse that break down. And Chuck mm -hmm. Smith really was the one that is to thank for that. So, um, not to be said about Lonnie Frisbee, he would go out on the beach during the day and hang out with hippies and surfers, lead them to Jesus, bring them back to church for nightly services. They would do these mass baptisms on the beach. This Christian commune, the House of Miracles, grew into 19 separate communal houses. It's just crazy. It, it ended up becoming a movement that had 175 communal houses that had 100,000 members. And uh, we read that now and we're like, holy cow, like communes? But you got to think, man, this is the 60s hmm. in California. Like the hippie movement, that was pretty common, right? So the media started noticing this because, I mean, like, no church is reaching these people. These people are the the pariah of a lot of churches. Like, they're mm -hmm. a lot of churches are preaching against these kids. You know, telling them to cut their hair and their music is all, you know, terrible and all this stuff. And instead, the Jesus movement and the churches that are reaching them, particularly Calvary Chapel and Costa Mesa, they're bringing in these people that aren't welcome in any other church they're allowing their music to be used in the service just to make, you know, they, they call it Jesus music. And so the first time you see guitars and drums and, you know, contemporary music in a service with a Jesus message. And man, it starts to spread like wildfire. And so before you know it, it's across the entire country. Um, in Houston, there's 11,000 teens that choose to accept Jesus as their Savior. You've got popular musicians like Johnny Cash, Eric Clapton, Paul Stuckey, I think that's how you say his name. Peter, Paul, and Mary. Is that how you say his name? Stokey, yeah. Stuckey? Yeah. Stuckey rhymes with Dookie, so I don't think that'd be a good name to have. <laughs> Somewhere right now, there is a 68-year-old man who is just <laughs> screaming the correct pronunciation <laughs> yeah exactly of this name and pounding yeah. his fists on the steering wheel yeah. you don't know peter paul and mary no i'm sorry i mean i know them i just don't know how to pronounce paul's last name it's either stokey or stooky anyway old paul dookie if peter paul and mary um and then our our favorite uh one of my favorite musicians bob dylan has an experience with the lord jesus in this movement and he then puts out an album called slow train coming which is his gospel album 
Which is great. Like you, can't, you cannot mention the name Bob Dylan without just doing a... I know, I know. I want to so Bob bad. <laughs> I want to so bad. I'm trying to think. So Slow Train Come is a little bit different, but I mean, it's... You're going to have to save somebody. Because he's a little bit gruffer in that. And then early, early Bob Dylan is a little bit like, you know... Uh, trying to think of a good line there's just a lot of is and e. Mm-hmm. and if you've never heard bob dylan you're like what's wrong with you josh if you heard bob dylan you're probably judging my impersonation but i used to impersonate bob dylan a lot in college i used to think it was pretty funny to do but nobody else did anyway hmm. so bob dylan has his born again days because of the jesus people movement and so yeah i mean it's a pretty pretty impactful movement unfortunately Lonnie Frisbee um he's a very complex figure he struggled with his sexuality throughout his life and so there were seasons of his life where he kind of left the ministry and went back to living a homosexual lifestyle and then he would repent and come back to the Lord and then he would go back to that lifestyle and then he would repent and come back to the Lord and and so, um, you know, we can we can say what we want about Lonnie Frisbee. Again, he's a very complex figure, but nevertheless, he was exceptionally influential. And I would say, really, him and Chuck Smith together, God used them mightily, um, not just to win over these young people in California, but really to start a movement that sparked all across the, the country. Hmm. So... Real quick, the theology, the controversy, and the aftermath, and then we're done. The theology, very much, let's get back to the lifestyle of the early Christians. Let's live in a commune. Let's share all of our stuff together. Let's live simply. Let's not worry about, you know, materialistic stuff. Let's not worry about things getting, you know, we don't need the stained glass and the massive pipe organ and wearing the nice suits. Man, we just need Jesus. Um... Heavy emphasis on relational evangelism, like walking up and down the beaches and, hey, what's going on? Do you know Jesus? Um, which is really cool, I think. Just kind of that simple, laid-back approach to everyday Christianity without dressing it up. and um, A strong belief in miracles, signs and wonders, faith, healing, prayer, the Bible, the works of the Spirit. Um, a strong emphasis on evangelism. So leading people to the Lord, um, a strong emphasis on the belief that Jesus was coming back at any point. Um, so we probably have the Jesus people to thank for movies like A Thief in the Night and mm-hmm. A Distant Thunder and all those really horrifying apocalyptic movies in the 1970s. So thanks, Jesus people. Mm-hmm. But... Uh, the communal aspect was a very distinct feature of this, that, that the the group, the church, was more important than the individual. And this was kind of what leads to some of the controversy, because some of these communes became highly authoritarian and even spiritually abusive. And so that's kind of the controversies there. But um, you know, it's funny, the biggest controversy in Jesus Street was racial intermingling. The biggest mm-hmm. controversy of the Jesus people <laughs> was the fact they all had long hair and went barefoot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think Christian music was, uh, you know, greatly influenced. I and mean, there's some, some artists that came out of the Jesus movement um, that yeah. you know, are still known today and greatly influenced the Christian music industry. Um like you mentioned, some, there was already you know some well-established artists that converted to Christianity through the Jesus movement and influence of it. But um, I think even internally, there were some artists that were spun out of it that uh, that were pretty prolific as well. Absolutely, and we wouldn't have Christian contemporary music, modern praise and worship music without the Jesus people movement. That was really, I think, their biggest contribution. I mean, it was a huge deal. You know, I mean, can you imagine every church? up until then would probably just sing old hymns that have been around for hundreds of years. And so there's this influx of musicians and artists that come in and say, man, we love to create art. We love to create music. We're going to create art and music, but we're going to 
create art and music that's about the Lord that we can sing in church together. Um, mm-hmm. And so that's amazing. And we look back on that now and we're like, that's, that's incredible. But at the time it caused a lot of controversy because they're bringing in elements of kind of, you know, rock music and things like that, which a lot of people said this doesn't belong in the church. Um, yeah. One um, controversy. My, my parents, I was going to say my parents kind of grew up in that era and were, it, were influenced by, by the Jesus movement. And so I grew up listening and knowing about uh, like a lot of Keith Green, uh, second yeah. chapter of Acts, which you have listed on there. I mean, all those mm-hmm. guys, like my, my parents would play them. I remember Sunday mornings, you wake up to the sound of Larry Norman, you know, it's like, that's just yes. that's the thing. Hang on. You keep talking because I want to grab my Larry Norman album. Oh, no. I'm going to yeah, talk about see. Josh going to get his Larry Norman album. Here's my Larry Norman album if you're watching you on right YouTube. There. there it is. Yeah. Which Larry Norman is a... <laughs> Like, really good music, by the way. In case you're interested in Larry Norman, you should go look him up. There he is. There's a picture of him right there. But, uh, yeah, man, he's um, he's one of those guys that I don't think... I don't think that today his stuff would be on, like, 94 FM The Fish here in Nashville. Because he talks about getting hepatitis on Valentine's Day. That's, that's a lyric on one of his songs. <laughs> It's called Why Don't You Give Jesus a Try, I think is the name of the song. And, um, yeah, so I mean, like, obviously that's a little bit controversial, but at the time, man, he was speaking to the, he was speaking to people that were in the hippie movement, so that's nothing. I mean, that's nothing for them to blush at at all, you know? But, um, yeah. One controversial aspect of the Jesus people movement, besides just long hair, going barefoot, listening to Jesus rock, was that some of these communal groups over time devolved into cults, which is unfortunate. Mm-hmm. So like the cult, the children of God, or another cult, the family, which I, I don't know if the family is the same as the children of God, but at any rate, those both started as Christian communes in the Jesus movement, and then they kind of divulged into cult groups, unfortunately. And um, some of them, again, became very authoritarian, but... Um, so really the aftermath is, like we said, praise and worship music, CCM. But the reason that in most American churches today, you walk in on a Sunday morning and you don't have to wear a suit and tie is because of the Jesus People Movement. Um, before the Jesus People Movement, like church was a very, very formal affair. And the Jesus People Movement was kind of bringing it down to the level of anybody is welcome here. Um, there was birth of new Christian denominations, so obviously Calvary Chapel, Chuck Smith's church, planted churches all over the country and all over the world. So Calvary Chapel, there's a couple thousand of them now across the world. The Vineyard Movement, um, kind of what's known as third wave charismatic non-denominational churches come through that. And then again, uh, kind of an explosion of Christian subculture. You really didn't have Christian radio, Christian TV, Christian movies, Christian concerts, Christian camps, Christian celebrities, Christian amusement parks like Heritage Land USA. You didn't have that until the Jesus People movement. So, uh, yeah. Thousands and thousands and thousands of young people came to faith in Christ. Guys like Greg Laurie. So um, somebody on our Facebook, I think, uh, was talking about how her and her husband were at Greg Laurie's church in California. He's in... Uh, doing gospel crusades. He he was a part of this. Um, hmm. Guys like, I'm trying to think of some Calvary Chapel guys you may have heard of even now. Um, Joe Foch out of Philadelphia. He's a Calvary Chapel pastor. Came to faith through that. Guys like Skip Herzig and um, I think he's in yeah. Phoenix maybe. Um, yeah, Skip is one of my one of one of my favorite Bible teachers. He's he's a phenomenal. Teacher. Oh yeah, he's incredibly he's articulate and really really good. Uh, David Guzik, if you've ever done enduring word commentary, he's a Calvary Chapel guy. Um, and yeah, I mean, all this came about through this movement of one pastor just going, I just want to reach people, and I'm willing to try mm-hmm. something different to reach people, and I just think that's amazing. So. 
Gabe, what do you make about some of the controversies involved in it? Yeah, it's tough. I mean, like we've we said in prior episodes, it's 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 easy to say it just write everything off because there's some controversy, but the hard thing to say is like, well, it's it's probably really complex and it's it's probably it's probably best that I that I not come to these hard and fast conclusions because I wasn't there and mm-hmm. I have I have seen in my own lifetime how the media can spin things and how people can spin things and discredit stuff. So it's like I just want to kind of refrain from criticizing and casting judgment and just look at the the aftermath of it. Like I mentioned a couple episodes ago, look at the ripples that are still rippling out and assess are those good or are those bad. And I see hmm. with the Jesus movement, I see a lot of a lot of productivity come out of it and. Um, you know, I, I think I mean, my own upbringing was influenced by, by this movement and no, mine this, too. I, I, it really appeals to me, kind of the simplicity and the back to the basics of our faith kind of aspects of the Jesus movement, um, really appeal to me and really resonate with me. So, yeah. So like, what would it take in our hour of human history to have a move of God like that happen today? Hmm. Man, I don't know. I mean, really, I'm, I'm almost convinced that we would need a series of of acts and in, in the supernatural um, hmm. to get people, or some kind of calamity, or um, great time of desperation. I mean, really, hmm. and I think we're just so. <laughs> as the lady on the the uh, the viral meme says we're all kind of just fat and sassy (laughs) all fat and sassy soups and breads yeah soups and breads we're gonna get all fat and sassy fat and sassy it's kind of like it's kind of how we are right now and we just don't really need a move of god i mean so i think if there were to be a a time of desperation whatever causes that i think that might that might spark something like this yeah i think it's leonard ravenhill in his book why revival Terry says the reasons many of us don't experience revival is we think we can live without one, Hmm. you know? And I think about how that must have felt to be in Costa Mesa, California, to come to church every single Sunday and sit around the same people. But then you're driving past the beaches and there's these teenage runaways dropping acid on the beaches and nobody's going out and telling about Jesus. Hmm. You know what I mean? Like how, how long did people, drive past that and it just burdened the snot out of them before they just said, you know what? I don't, I don't care. We're doing something to reach these kids. They need Jesus. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, and even going back to Azusa street, I mean, like, again, I don't agree entirely with the doctrine of Azusa street, but I mean, you see a hunger there for a real experience with God that breaks down these racial divides and unites people and brings the power and the presence of God into a place that's tangible. And I, I don't know, I, I think it all starts with just a desperation and a hunger and a burden and, and a willingness to say, God, whatever it is you want, we're, we're in and we'll do it. So, Yeah, and Very I think cool. in all these movements, there's some, some really good aspects that we could learn from and draw from and emulate within our, within our meetings and gatherings and kind of balance them with... with um, you know, everyday life, you know, and I think yeah. that's the essence, the essence of kind of what, why we're doing this is, is looking at what are some, what are some characteristics of these movements that we could, we could draw from. Um, there are yeah. some imbalances in these movements, I would say that we kind of maybe don't want to emulate, but sure, um, sure. There, there's a lot of good in each of these for sure. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, cool. Well, thank you guys so much for listening and uh, appreciate the feedback from so many of you guys. Um, yeah, next few episodes, we're going to be talking about some more modern revivals like Brownsville, Toronto, and an incident called the Lakeland Outpouring. So I've already had some folks reach out to me about some of that. So it's pretty interesting how those are going to uh, flesh out. So there might be some surprises with that. So really excited about that. But um Anyway, if you got questions, oh, concerns, ask, or go ahead. 
Yeah, I, I was going to say, as we get closer in time, we're going to experience uh, more emotional connections and more, I guess, more just connections yes. in general, personal connections to these things, because we're getting now into, when we hit Jesus movement, it's like, we're talking about our parents' generation now, so sure. we're getting into more yeah. modern era, we're going to find people who are a little bit more, like I said, uh, connected to some of these movements, so it's going to get interesting. Very much so, yeah, so I'm really looking forward to it, so uh, anyway, yeah, if you got questions or anything like that, man reach out prison bible podcast at gmail.com or send us a message on the facebook so hope uh, everybody is doing fantastic between now and the next time we talk you guys take care